The Carnegie Mellon Quarantine Database Talks are made possible by the Stephen Moy Foundation for Keeping It Real and by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Uh, the pandemic continues, uh, so let's talk about databases. Today we're excited to have Matt Friels. He's the CTO, or sorry, he's the co-founder and former CTO of, of Fauna, um, but now he's the chief architect. Uh, and prior to that, he was a technical lead at Twitter, and that's where they learned about distributed databases. And they said, okay, let's go build a better one. And that's what, how Fauna gets started. So again, as always, if you have any questions, please uh, unmute yourself, interrupt at any time, say who you are, where you're coming from, and ask Matt a question. We want this to be interactive. And as always, we, we'd like to thank the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real for sponsoring this event. Okay, Matt, the floor is yours. Go for it. Thank you. All right. Um... Yeah, I'm super happy to talk to y'all here, though. Um, this is the first time I've given a talk on Zoom and I've heard everyone else like say that it's super weird not having any sort of feedback and I now I completely agree. So, so th this is why I want people to interrupt you and ask questions as we go along. So yeah. you don't talk for an hour and thinking like, is anybody even listening? <laughs> yeah. Right, so I, I, at least I will try to interrupt because I have questions. All right. That sounds great. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, I came uh, to here to talk to you uh, about Fauna, um, which is a, a distributed database that we built um, at um, Fauna Inc. Um, and um, yeah, so I guess the title is like, I want, I want the lessons learned building a Calvin based system. So, you know, if you're familiar with Calvin, it's a, a distributed transaction protocol. I'd say alternative to two phase commit, and I guess we can just get right into it. So, focus on that um, and try to give a Brief overview of Fauna to provide some context as to why I made the decision we did, and then you know, kind of get into the protocol and some of the uh, details there itself. So, um, yeah, so startup. What is Fauna? Um, so Fauna is um, kind of like the short, the short, and short of it is that Fauna's general purpose OLTP database as a service. Um, kind of like our goal was to build an app. You know, the idea of like database as an application backend. Um, and based on, you know, Evan, my co-founder, and my experience at Twitter, um, building these sorts of systems for, um, uh, you know, for, for Twitter itself. Um, so kind of like to give you the shape of it. So it's a NoSQL database. Um, you know, the kind of the, the main core printers are documents plus uh, global secondary indexes. Um, I guess unique about Fauna is it's not based on SQL. Um, Right, like obviously as a NoSQL data document database, it's not, but we, we have our own programming language, our own query language called FUL um, that is uh, kind of like inspired by uh, programming languages. So it, you know, it has, the, the, it unifies uh, querying transactions and store procedures into one, into one, um, uh, into one language that you um, program as, as an embedded DSL in, in, your, in your application code. Um, and then recently, you know, last year we added a GraphQL API, um, which provides um, like easier interop, um, you know, especially on, you know, kind of like front end environments and, and kind of like is seen you know, especially suited for like basic cred use cases um, that you may want to start with and then jump into, you know, FQL for more advanced logic. Um, the other, the other interesting aspect of Fauna is that it is, um, um, we like to call it serverless. Now I know that's kind of a, kind of a, we, you know, scary buzzword. It really, I find it kind of reminiscent of cloud back in the days. But I think the real idea behind serverless, or the way we think about it, is that the point is that, um, you know, it's 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 a system designed with the idea of removing the the, the node or the server as an abstraction in your application architecture. So um, for Fauna, that means we should, we deliver as a global um, API that's directly accessible over the open internet, protected by keys, and you know you know, supports like, you know, cheap sessionless, um, you know, connections and requests and things like that. Um, again, like you don't provision nodes, um, you provision abstract resources like databases. And then the con consumption itself is metered in terms of, um, in terms of um, what we call ops. So like, you know, abstract reads, writes and, um, and compute. Um, so, I mean, to kind of like the theory behind this is that what we see is, 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 you know, kind of like the, in some ways, the general industry moving more towards this like new architecture that we you know, like to call client serverless and ideas as, as you know, your 
kind of like your end user clients, like your mobile apps, your browser apps, become more powerful, that more of the presentation and, you know, and even much of the business logic can actually push, you know, to the edge as far as possible. And then um, ultimately, um, you know, these other parameters like databases compute, you know, and like, you know, SMS and things like that, you know, those APIs get pushed more towards the edge and the benefits that we've had for a longer time, you know, static assets in the form of CDNs become available to these other, to these other, to these other APIs. Um, but I, I think, um, I mean, an another key goal is really, you know, to you know, essentially empower application developers. You know, we started with Fauna sort of as application developers who wanted a database um, to suit our needs. And so we were very concerned with, um, you know, essentially making it as easy to use as possible to enable productivity, you know, for, you know, for folks building applications that are consuming databases and, and trying to cater to those needs. So, um, you know, and that's led to some design choices like, you know, favoring, uh, we, we, we tried to design FQL to um, kind of like guide the user towards predictable performance rather than relying on, you know, query optimization, which can, you know, sometimes feel like magic to give, you know, the performance that the user expects. So, you know, like you have, for example, you have to query fauna, you know, via an index, there's no declarative querying um, that, you know, can potentially fall to a table scale, or, you know, potentially fall to a table scan. Like we have filtering and primitives and stuff like that, but, you know, you kind of like, you know what you're getting into when you use those. Um, and there's ways to explicitly opt into, you know, um, more more efficient uh, querying. Um, another big thing that kind of came out wasn't part of the original um, plan, but I think we really, um, I mean, it's, it's made a lot of sense as we develop the functionality. It really led to a lot of in, in the investment into uh, transactions. Is this idea that strong consistency? I like to borrow a term that kind of like Rust seems it's popularized, like this idea of fearless concurrency. Um, I mean, I, I think that you know ultimately, like you know rich transactional semantics um, really are a productivity tool um, more than anything else. Like we, you know, as an application developer, you don't want to be a database developer and think about, you know, you know, caching and where your data is located and consistency and, and concurrency. Like ideally you focus on your, your business logic. Um, you know, and I think also, um, you know, we, we, we you know, and the simplicity comes out too in the interface, like you, it, transactions are implicit in Fauna, like you, you, you send a query, you, you make a request, and that is the scope of a transaction. Um, um, you know, so, so the interface is designed to kind of like be as, uh, as transparent as possible in that sense. Um, so, you know, kind of getting into the architecture. So, I mean, kind of like to sum up what I talked about, I, I think the key points are, you know, that school by default, um, you know, we expect, um, you know, clients to access the system over the open internet. Um, and there's also, you know, kind of like, you know, high latency connections between, um, between regions in the system. And so, you know, as we were pursuing strong consistency, you know, we started looking around for, you know, different, you know, different um, multi-partition transaction protocols that we thought would allow us to, you know, kind of like, um, you know, provide those features well, you know, with as few trade-offs as possible. Yeah, so the goal, you know, is to minimize overall latency, you know, and it, so, so the goal is to minimize latency, because like latency, you know, ultimately is an enemy in the kind of system that we're trying to build. Um, and so, I mean, there's no getting around the speed of light, there's no getting, getting around that, you know, clients can be potentially very, you know, far away from, you know, the, you know, one of the regions that the system's deployed in. So the way to, you know, reduce latency is by, you know, reducing round trips. So, um, you know, kind of not in scope for this talk, but probably interesting later is, is, is around like the interaction model between the client and the server. Um, but like, you know, our query language is designed to pack as much as possible into a single request, ship that to the database, let it turn on it, and then get a result back. Um, rather than, you know, kind of like your typical session transaction, which tends to be very chatty between client and server. Like that works really great if your client's very close to your database. It's not so great if that um, interaction is over, you know, a latent connection. Um, but kind of the focus of what I want to talk today is, is like, you know, what we saw in, um, you know, you know, with, with this big idea in Calvin, um, 
you know, decided to minimize coordination by, you know, by, with its goal of trying to, you know, minimize, you know, the coordination of, of running a multi-partition transaction and kind of like how we could adapt that to this environment. It's a little bit, yeah, in some ways it's a little bit different from, I think the goals of the paper, which is, um, um, you know, at least when I read, you know, when I first came across it, like I seemed to focus on like high throughput um, and stuff like that, as opposed to, I think, specifically honing in, you know, focusing in on the, you know, what, 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 what we saw as the advantages in a, in a highly latent environment. I mean, because um, because he built that off of the like Astro stuff. It was like, how can you do it better than what Astro can do? That like in Astro was all about performance, so that made sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know, I realized I didn't. I, I, I guess Calvin needs an introduction, or at least I forgot it. But you know, for those who know, Calvin um, was um, um, the, the the original paper. Uh, I believe was published like 2012, and it was a. Uh, uh, Alex Thompson and Daniel Body and some others um, who uh, were responsible the, for it. There's the case of determinism. I think that was 2011, and then the Calvin paper itself, I think, was 2012. Yeah, like it was yeah. Alex Thompson was the lead author, and then he won the, the the Jim Gray dissertation award in like 2015 for it, or 2014, or like, I, don't, I don't remember when. Oh, that's I didn't realize that. That's cool. Yeah, he won after I won. Um. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, Big A and Calvin, minimizing coordination by predetermining order. So, I mean, I, I, Calvin was, you know, I think one of the first systems to, to um, like, um, you know, re really, I think, I think, promote this idea of deterministic transactions. And so kind of like, uh, compared to your classic two-phase commit, which mixes the, um, the, uh, you know, you know, evaluation of the transaction and determining what effects are going to be committed with the process of coordinating cross nodes kind of all, all in, you know, in, a, in an initial step followed by a commit, um, you know, Calvin at its core actually reduces that or, or actually um, um, flips that. So um, in core Calvin, you know, a transaction is submitted to the log and then afterwards, uh, the outcome of that transaction is, you know, it's submitted to log and ordered, and then afterwards, the outcome of that tra transaction is determined uh, through, uh, you know, essentially determining deterministic replay of the transaction effects. And now, you know, kind of going forward, like I'm gonna, you know, kind of like zip through hopefully as quickly as possible, like you know, Fauna's, you know, Fauna's, you know, I think overall transaction protocol with this does a bit more, and then I'll try to point out some of the Calvin specific aspects and how we use it. Um, Anyway, so in Fauna, um, the life of the transaction is really in three stages. So in the first stage, um, you know, so you know, first we evaluate um, the actual query language body the expression we get, um, and then and then there and then there's a step where um, um, we do transaction effect sequencing, we get, get gets committed to the log, and then. Um, and afterwards, you know, and then finally, once that's done, there's a determinist effect um, uh, that, you know, we, we determine to apply the effects of that, uh, the effects of that transaction, and then, and then discover the outcome. I'll walk through that in a little more detail. Um, but also on the side here, I'll point out, um, you know, our, our, my, my terminology, just kind of like through, you know, what we've developed, you know, on the system, you know, over, over the years, this has drifted a bit, you know, from you know, the, the terms in the paper. So um, like in the paper, the paper talks about the sequencer, the schedule and the storage and storage. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to label kind of like the way, the way um, we have these, you know, we have three roles in, in Fauna, you know, the coordinator, um, the log and, uh, you know, log and storage. And, you know, they sort of correspond with what, you know, what the labels are in Calvin, but not quite. Um, and you probably hear dogs in the background. The, dog, the dogs are on cue. The dogs are on cue. I, I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> it's fine. Um, anyways, all right. So live the transaction. So, um, so this is you know you know consider consider your, your typical um, three replica three partition uh, cluster. Uh, a client comes in um, and sends its request sends a you know. A query request to you know a random node in a random replica. This happens to be you know our number one. Um, so this 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 node in this replica is going to adopt the coordinator role uh, for this for, for for this request. Um, now 
I, I failed to mention on the last slide the coordinator role is it's it's a you know it's a it's a stateless transient role. Um, you know we've talked about in the future like right now, you know kind of implied in this graphic, um, like the the roles are effectively virtual. You know you know vir virtual nodes in the system. You know um, ultimately I see I see Fauna growing up to be more of a service oriented architecture, and so this is you know this this is a a layer we pull out, but um, Anyway, so with the with the um, you know the coordinator um, um, evaluate as actually you know fully responsible for evaluating FQL or, or GraphQL, uh, the first thing it does is it chooses a snapshot time, um, and it either uses the uh, so the, the 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 client will pass in um, the timestamp of the last seen transaction um, that it's previously processed or. Um, and then the the the, the node itself um, has a clock, which we call the read clock, which is which is based on wall time minus um, minus a, a delay, which we'll get into later. Um, based on that snapshot time, it um, it'll evaluate the reason the query. So consider this query. This query might be, um, you know, I mean, let's 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 ima imagine your typical bank query where you know, you're you know transferring you know some amount from one from one account to the other, right? So um, um, so the first thing we need to do is we need to actually like read the result, you know, read, read the, read the initial, uh, balances of those, of those two accounts. Um, and let's say in this example, um, those two, you know, the, the documents representing those, those accounts happen to be on data partitions owned by nodes one and two, um, in this replica. Um, I should point out that like our, our data partitioning is, is you know, is it very similar, you know, is essentially the, the identical to the way, the way Cassandra does it. So each node has a separate, um, you know, or sorry, say each replica um, has a, um, or each node in each replica has a number of tokens. Those that get distributed around a token ring, which correspond to ranges and then keys of documents and index terms gets hashed into that ring. Um, and that's how the system assigns ownership. Anyways, so back to the coordinator. So what the coordinator is going to do, um, you know, very typical kind of like query about, you know, like query or like, you know, or, or language interpretation evaluates reads. Um, um, the reads come back and they contain, you know, the value of the read at the snapshot time and also the, um, the last modified time. Um, you know, the, the timestamp of the transaction that last modified that, um, you know, that document or 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 index um, or index term. Um, additionally, writes are buffered local. You know, writes are buffered inside the query evaluation context. So there's no there's no um, there's no transmission of write effects or anything. That's all completely local at this point. Um, and then what what the result of the result of query evaluation is um, you know a tentative result value that you know we could potentially just you know send back to the client depending on what happens later on. As well as this tuple of um, 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 read keys plus their modified timestamps and the set of write effects that the uh, that query about that you know that we want to apply to the system um, if we can. All right, so this is um, now we're, we're now we're getting on to the to the um, to the log roll, and so it's, I think it's, it's, it's worth pointing out that like while there are you know essentially kind of like three these three stages in the commit. The important fact is that the only stage in in you know tran in transaction in, in the transaction process that requires any global any any sort of like global communication is this um, um, is is what happens in the, in the log in the you know in the logs part in the log stage of transaction processing. So um, um, so the coordinator submits a transaction. Object, the like the effect object that tuple to um to you know a random log partition um, currently like the fauna tries to send um, a send a transaction to the closest log leader so whatever you know so if there happens to be a log leader in that in that replica um, it'll send it there otherwise it might choose um it'll it'll choose one of the other replicas um, the log leader is responsible for um kind of like um, the log leader is actually is 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 the, is the you know they're sorry the node with the role of log leader for a partition is responsible for batching at transactions on a heartbeat 
and then and then and then submitting them to um, to consensus. So um, the heartbeat, you know, we essentially it's, it's it's literally just a thread that's ticking every ten milliseconds, um, grabbing all pending batches and then submitting to the log. Um, it all it also chooses the wall time. I'll get I'll get into like what what how we use uh, time, you know, kind of later on. But it um, it it will write out um, uh, at like a essentially a tentative epic ID, you know, based on that wall time. So uh, note note like you know obviously like wall time you know can go forwards or backwards you know you know especially depending on node restart right and we don't rely on we don't rely on the timestamps chosen at this point to be uh, to be ordered that happens um, um, and I'll may talk a bit about how like how we deal with that later um, but anyway so batch gets submitted to um, um, to a global consensus process um, we have we use um, you know, it's essentially a modified version of Raft that allows for um, uh, quorum-based um, quorum-based acceptance, so that we don't have to bottleneck on the leader for acknowledgement, which saves us a hop in kind of that global communication path. Um, and then, so essentially, once but anyways, so once that batch is, um, you know, once once the batch has been acknowledged, committed by the consensus members, um, then we proceed on. At this point, durability is what you know. The, the key thing here is that durability is achieved at this point. You know, transaction processing will will proceed, um, and an outcome will be determined. Um, um, even if you know the client you know times out and goes away, you know, on the on the top end of the of the of the process. All right. So once um, again, and, and so you know, and again, this this stage is also kind of like. This is kind of, I would say like this stage is important to kind of pay attention to because this is, I think, a key, you know, kind of like core to how Calvin works is that, um, um, so, you know, it, it, I, I, there are way too many errors going on, so I didn't make them all black, but you notice there's some like other red arrows um, in this log, um, this log layer. So like, you know, our one partition is ticking and, and generating, you know, batches and transactions for, for an epic every, every heartbeat. So is every other, so is every other leader Every other partition leader in the cluster. So you have all these um, all these log leaders, you know, you know, ticking, publishing batches, um, which may be empty every ten milliseconds. Um, and it's very critical that the system continues to do this because it's that process that that um, it's that process that actually drives time forward in the system, and um, and, and um, allows um, storage nodes to process the effects. So. Um, at at the at the at the storage layer, so which is um, you know, so in in, in original Calvin terms, you know, everything happening to the log layer is essentially you know, like, you know that that falls under sequencer role, um, in Calvin. Um, this next part is um, is the role of, is, is this role of scheduler. So what happens is each each um, each uh, node in, in in you know each storage uh, role will um, has to um, receive a a, a a filtered batch from each log partition uh, for, for for the given epic that it's that it's currently processing, um, and it's important it's important that it actually pulls together a, a complete batch. So this is this is um, so if, if it's the case where like a a, a batch is is missed, uh, like for example, um, you know say say a, uh, you know one one log node you know dies or something like that. Um, but before the, before the storage node can continue processing, it has to actually go find a copy of that batch somewhere else. Um, so, but um, I mean, I, I think I don't really, um, if we have time, we can talk about it later, but one interesting thing I think we learned here is this, well, well, I think for efficiency's sake, it's important to think about, um, you know, this process is a pipeline um, like of, like a, a, a streaming pipeline of, of, of messages that could kind of like push through, propagate it all the way down. But the system can fall back onto kind of like normal, or you know, the, the system can you know, you know, in in the case of failure, it falls back to you know, essentially a request response model where it starts you know, starts uh, requesting missing uh, batches as um, um, if if it does if it doesn't receive them from you know, kind of like you know, through the normal happy online path. Um, anyway, so once a storage node has like uh, a batch from has a filtered batch for a given epic. From every from every log partition, it's at that point that I can actually um, um, generate a a transaction timestamp for each transaction, 
that, it, that it's going that it's going to apply. And so what um, and so the, at the sequencing stage, we take transactions in that order, um, and then we sequence them be um, based on uh, the keys that the keys that the sorry the, the keys that the transaction touches. So like you know two 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 transactions that don't have any key overlap can execute in parallel. Um, another two that have any sort of have any key overlap are, are um, or ordered um, based on their transaction ID. Uh, one kind of interesting note is it's like in, in the Calvin, you know, literature on Calvin, they talk about um, a reordering transaction based on say like number of covered keys, um, you know, to try to reduce, um, you know, to, 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 to try to, to, to increase parallelism. I mean, in practice, I've talked to Dan about this, it doesn't actually matter because 10 milliseconds is such a small window that, you know, kind of like a normal, you know, normal course of operations, it makes more sense to just focus on uh, the efficiency of the pipeline and minimizing processing here than it is to really kind of like try to um, try to re reorder transactions in the 10 millisecond window. Um, any contention there ends up being more of a problem than, you know, basically the reordering doesn't really buy you anything because you can't reorder outside that 10 millisecond boundary anyways. And since the rest of the process is pipelining, you're going to, you know, you're going to end up waiting on contention whether you can reorder or not. So there's really not much, you know, it's a limited, it, the reordering inside of batch is of limited uh, usefulness. Um, all right. Um, how long? How long did it take you to figure out figure that out? Like, what did you? Was that like immediately? Like, did you did you guys try to implement it and say this sucks? Let's not do it. Or did what is like you just did the math no. and it work out? Yeah. Well, I mean, we yeah we sort of like, I mean, first of all, we didn't do it, and then we decided that it wasn't worth it uh, based on kind of just like, um, you know, the, the throughput numbers we were getting. And um, yeah, we did some experiments there, but uh, you know, I, I think uh, uh, honestly, I, we there, we'd probably could explore a little more. But I, I would say, like you know, the initial implementation to do any sort of reordering, like the analysis of the pi of the pipeline, was actually caused it to be slower than just like shoving everything through as fast as you could, anyways. So I mean, I also imagine it's somewhat workload specific. So I'm guessing from the workloads you see from like real production databases or applications, it doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think we're more worried about, you know, like, I mean, I'm more concerned is like, you know, um, like, so, you know, it, it's going to be like, there's gonna be one hot key that a lot of transactions involve. And I, that is that is being that like, you know, something more dominant. So yeah, it's like, you know, the, the kind of work, the kind of workload that like reordering would help with, would be where you have like one kind of like bulk transaction that runs through. And you're trying to end the other with a bunch of small ones. And that's just like, um, you know, I, I just, um, in, in, in practice, in practice, it's just, you know, they're rare enough that it's, it's not really worth you know, yeah. considering that there's better ways, there's better ways to do that, like break up a large transaction to the smaller sub transactions and interleave them with other, you know, other requests going on a system in, in kind of like a higher level fashion. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Um, all right. So, um, once we've gotten to order, once we've gotten to sequencing, at that point, um, storage nodes can move on to actually applying the effect, and, you know, applying transaction effects. Um, so, you know, again, in our example, where we had the two, you know, the two, 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 two document transaction. Um, you know, we have to we have to get the last mod we have to get the um, we have to recheck the last modified time of each document to make sure that the document hasn't been modified. Um, you know, between when uh, the coordinator really originally read it and, and, you know, and determine the, the tentative write effects. And at this point, you know, in, 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 serial, in, in serial order. So it's, um, you know, in other words, you know, we're using Calvin as a, um, you know, we, you know, we're using Calvin to, um, you know, perform uh, optimistic concurrency control. Um, so um, where was I? Yeah. So, anyway, so if 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 um, if document if the if you know documents or terms if if, if nothing has been modified since uh, you know be between read and you know at this point in the transaction processing, um, the system's allowed to you know we haven't we know we haven't violated serializability. We're allowed to actually write those effects, and so the rights are up, you know the rights are applied to storage, and um, the the coordinator um, is only waiting for one. Um, the coordinator is only waiting for one response from any from anyone. Who's just, so the the, fir the first the first storage node that that finishes you know processing its copy of the transaction, um, 
you know, it sends it back to the coordinator. Okay, here's the transaction timestamp that was actually generated, and here's whether or not we could apply. You know, here's whether or not we could actually apply effects or not. Um, and then based on that, uh, the coordinator can either retry the transaction. You know, we have we have you know a limited amount of like you know transparent retry in the face of contention, um, and you know, and you know, and, and if like the like the overall deadline has been exceeded or like, you know, the, too much, there's too much contention on, on one of the keys involved, then we um, kick back failure to, uh, to the client. Um, do, so do, do customers have to specify where the replicas are located ahead of time or do you, you just, do you geo replicate it always or how does that work? Um, right now, so right now, um, no, the, the customers don't have any control. Um, and right now, yeah, everything's geo replicated. Um, and you know, there, there's no, there, the, you know, the, the how how documents are 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 how documents are distributed across uh, nodes in a replica two is also um, um, completely abstracted. There is some control over you know how indexes are partitioned, but one of the interesting things we found out is that like users just don't care, um, right? Because you know there, there there's a calculus between you know the. And this is a work in progress. Like I don't, I don't think that we're fully, we fully got this right here. But there's a calculus where, like you know, we've, we've, if we, we provide an API that that disincentivizes users from essentially caring about where how their data is laid out until they really get into the performance weeds. And more often than not, we end up caring before they do because we want you know to you know maintain the resilience of the system. So, so I, I don't necessarily have a good answer there, like how much control we give versus how you know compared to like how we actually incentivize users to you know lay out their data as, in, as efficiently as possible um, what, what, what like maybe you'll, you'll get into this like what percentage of the of your customers are hitting the database within like it, it, like the application is always in the same location like it's not like you know one day you like you know one day you see a bunch of requests coming from europe the next day they're coming from south america mm -hmm. like the same database like how often how oh yeah often, that so we don't really see that as much. What we see is, um, I mean, to applications tend to be deployed in two different models. So one is kind of more traditional, where someone's talking to Fauna from their back end. Um, but like you know, one of our major customers, you know, they've deployed Fauna as you know, um, they're using Fauna for like content personalization for CDN. So they have like, you know, their app is is you know, they deploy Fauna so that their their end user browsers are hitting the service directly. And so in that case, you know, we're getting um, you know that one application where we get requests from from everywhere, um, and so that, that those are the kind of the, the the I mean those are the two workloads we tend to see, um, and you know and 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 also like you know sometimes there's a mix too, and we encourage it where you know if if you have um, you know if you have some complex compute, that's a good thing to throw into a service or in you know you know a, a serverless um, um, environment you know, like in, in, you know, behind AWS Lambda or something like that you know whatever is most convenient. Um, and then, um, but like, of course, you know, it's an option to, you know, hit the database directly from your client, if that makes sense. So. Kev, you have a question. Why don't you unmute yourself? Yeah, just a question about the chart. So I see replica one, two, and three. Replica one is on node one, two, and three. Uh, are replica two and replica three also on node one, two, and three, or are they on four, five, six, seven, eight, nine? Oh yeah, sorry. That's a good, that's a, yeah, that's an oversight on my part. Yes, there, there's, they're on, they're on nodes, uh, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So nine node cluster. Um, yeah, and like, you know, you know, for the purposes of discussion, like, you know, consider replica one, two, and three being like geodistributed. Um, so what, what is the average commit time for a transaction in Fauna across, across your entire fleet? Across the entire fleet? Um, in this environment, um, it is, it's highly dependent on the topology, um, but I like, uh, it's right now globally, I think it's like 150 milliseconds okay. on average. So, I mean, it's dominated by, it's dominated by that raft commit process. Like, you know, the, the reality is it's like, I mean, that was interesting thing, like, you know, one of the disadvantages on the surface of Calvin is it has this notion of an epic, right? So there's a latency floor of transaction commit, which is like you're just literally waiting for the next batch to kick over, right? So on average, like five milliseconds. Um, but the reality is, like, you know, you know, you know, you know, the trade-off. I mean, you know, the 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 trade-off here is in order to eliminate that, we'd have to, you know, go with something like, you know, like a two-phase commit process. But that gets that you know, that gets into um, 
there's just that some dis, there's disadvantages there in terms of the overall impact on the system. You know, the um, I'll, I'll ship I'll flip over to the next slide. But like for for comparison, like you know, you know, a, a read only trans like a, a read only transaction at, at serializability, like we only ever have to hit you know one replica. Like you know, for even for for the same key, it doesn't matter. You know, for the same key or same set or same document or or same set of documents, like I could. You know, you're going to get a serializable answer where you get a reference one, two, and three. And of course, you may get stale reads. You're not going to see the effect, but you're going to get that serial. You know, you're going to get that serializability guarantee, um, and you can opt into like higher levels if you want. Um, or, um, um, I guess I have a slide, so I should say this really. But or, or you know, you can pass a you know you can pass the read token across clients to get you know explicit coordination if you do have a case where like an actor is bouncing from one um, from like one one replica to another. I think we have a question from Alexei. Sure. Uh, hi, I would like to know if you support interactive transactions, like uh, select from table one, then maybe select from table two, and then start to table three in different statements and in different requests. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, we currently don't. Um, I mean, I would say, I mean, that's partly a design choice and a lack of, I was thinking, a lack of resources at this point. Um, but there, there's there's no architectural reason why we couldn't support them. It would just require a, like a, a very different uh, client interaction model we currently support, which is very request oriented. Um, you know, so, like for example, like I talked about SQL support, and I expect we'll get to it eventually. And you know, of course, we'll have session transactions at that point. But like one one in, I mean one interesting aspect is like the nice thing about having, um, you know nice thing about non-interactive transactions is, is there less leaky abstraction so for example like transparently retrying in the face of contention is something you can't really do you know if you're doing session transactions because you know the application code um, ends up being aware of those retries um, so yeah but um, it's interesting right because I, I think one, one of the interesting things I've, I've I've learned like talking about Calvin you know off and on over the years is that like yeah, then there, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a strong notion, I think, in the community that Calvin doesn't support uh, dependent transactions or, or non-deterministic transactions. And the, and the reality is that like, yeah, core Cal, the core process doesn't because you have to know your rewrite and set ahead of time. But like there's, there's, um, there's, there's pretty straightforward ways around that. You know, one of them covered in the, in the, in the paper, um, where you're using reconnaissance reads to discover a read and write set and then like, Committing on condition that not having changed. Okay. Um, all right. So that's kind of like brief rundown of the pro of, of of kind of like what the protocol itself is. Um, I kind of want to talk about some just just some interesting like tidbits and and, de and details that I touched on a little you know haphazardly you know with the with the with the chart, but. Um, that were worth highlighting. So one thing that's important to note is that um, I, this is the first one. So, you know, we, you know, we, you know, perhaps lazily talk about like timestamps and, you know, you know, we talk about snapshot time, transaction time, and stuff like that. The reality is, like timestamps and fauna are not timestamps, but they're logic, they're they're logical transaction IDs. Um, so they're generated by, um, you know, they're they're generated by. Um, the log process and they, they, they correspond with the, um, the transactions uh, position in the total order in the system. Um, now, I mean, it is, however, like, you know, because we're, because we're, you know, trying to generate epoch IDs, um, we're trying to generate these epic indexes, you know, as close to real time as possible, you know, there ends up being this best effort correlation with real time. Um, which is very convenient for app developers and ourselves where we can talk, you know, where we can talk about timestamps and things like that, you know, even in, in, you know, so, so we, we, we can use them as timestamps, you know, because they're close enough, even though, um, you know, what, what, in actuality, like we're, we're, we're providing a harder guarantee with, with our, with our um, timestamp slash transaction ID generation uh, process. Um, the second, I touched on this too, um, the, the, I think Calvin, I mean, um, you know, I, Fauna provides um, you know, some nice options for tunable, re, you know, tunable reconsistency. Like the baseline is serializable reads. Um, you know, uh, you know, stale reads can be a problem. 
but like there's there's ways for um you know there's there's ways for users to kind of like either you know we also like you know guarantee you know region rights or like session session consistency by default too um and then there's uh, there's options you know to to kind of like you know gain back stricter serializability and you know, all the way up to like full strict serializability um you know based on what's going on in your application um this you know what we found is it's like um you know, strict serializability for writes and serializability for reads we felt is like the, the you know kind of like the the the, the right trade-off between um you know latency and coordination or between between latency and consistency because for the most most of the time especially for the applications that we're you know we had in mind you know if you consider like you know your your, your like your, your your typical like you know 90 percent read 10 percent write application workload you know you want reads to be fast um and it's and it's um and you want writes to be kind of interactively fast but um it's 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 you you know a system which biases towards you know predictable you know, like you know, the kind of stronger consistency in write in, in writes, you know, we is susceptible to fewer application level bugs. Um, whereas, like, you know, you can be a bit, a bit more relaxed on reads. Um, and the 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 model that kind of the application developer, you know, has to keep in mind is one that's very similar to what you get in a concurrent system where you're dealing with like multi-threading and stuff like that. Um, and again, I talked about this before. You know, core Calvin, you know. You know, the Calvin at its core doesn't support non-deterministic transactions, um, but it's it's very it's very straightforward to layer them on top. Um, you know, we 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 use Calvin. You know, the baseline in our system is Calvin for optimistic concurrency control. But what I think one of the interesting we haven't really we haven't taken advantage of this, and I'm you know looking forward to being able to do so. But like, um, is is like, you know. Um, there's a large space for optimization within, you know, within the context of the protocol to, um, you know, to, to, you know, avoid, you know, avoid the contention bottlenecks of OCC by, you know, by performing query analysis to determine where you have a static read and write set or, or, you know, provide, provide, um, you know, provide the application developer like specialized functions that, um, you know, they can opt into, you know, special you know, specialized write effects that don't involve the OCC mechanism. So, I, mean, I think I think the Dynamo guys are pushing that approach as well. I I, I don't know how deep their analysis is, but there's a way to sort of declare the rewrite set ahead of time. So mm -hmm. you're just you're proposing that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I mean, I think I think the but the fast way to do it, yeah is to expose it to the, is expose it to the developer, right? Say, so, hey, like you know. You know, you know, provide a special function and say, "Hey, this is this is your, you know, call it your atomic operation function. You can do whatever you want here. Like, if you don't escape this little, you know, you can't escape this little box. Whatever you do in this box gets pushed um, directly to storage nodes and executes." Um, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to take that a little further and see what we can do via static analysis to be able to, you know, determine that ahead of time. But I, you know, I just there's only there is only so much that is possible, and, and we, I do want to be careful that we're like making those trade-offs explicit to the user uh, rather than you know having it be too magical um, especially since you know the difference between a transaction which you know goes to OCC in a high in a highly contented environment and one that can you know rely on the the more pessimistic you know locking nature of Calvin is, is pretty stark so we want to make that trade-off clear um, yeah and I, th I think like yeah and I, I would say like I'm not quite like, you know, foundations is, is adding some of these enhancements too, where like they, they're adding, you know, they can, they can do this. And so they're doing like adding atomic operations to push, you know, kind of like, you know, targeted effects, like closer to storage to reduce the coordination of the system. Um, okay. Um, so uh, on to, there, there's some interesting bits about uh, Fauna's assumptions on storage, I think are, are I think are worth pointing out. So um, um, Calvin, in, in contrast, like, you know, I, I want one of the pitches of Calvin, which I, you know, certainly was very appealing to, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to, to me as like not, you know, not coming in through databases, but coming in through distributed systems and applications was the idea of this, uh, was, was this notion of modularity. Um, you know, you read Calvin, it, it's, an ex it's an extremely elegant paper because, you know, it's completely separated out, you know, the replication 
or sorry, like the, the log replication function and storage and, you know, made, you know, essentially made them, you know, you know, has, and it's has built the system on top of that using these black box abstractions um, for, for, you know, each of these components. Um, however, um, what we found in the storage layer is by kind of assuming more, um, it made the system overall a bit more resilient. So um, like the first one was, um, you know, um, like relying on storage um, to be, you know, MVCC um, so that, um, and the key benefit here is that like in, um, in, in vanilla Calvin, like replicas uh, proceed, you know, essentially in lockstep, um, where if, if a node, um, like if a node, a node uh, can't fall behind, because if it does, um, the state of its peers um, can, if, if the state of, of, of peers, you know, of a node, you know, get, get too far ahead, then the node has no way to catch up because the state it relies on for reads goes away. Or you know, get, or gets replaced by newer versions. So we, um, so in, in Calvin, it, it's 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 pretty clear that like kind of like the unit of failure is the entire replica. Like if one node goes down in a replica, you know, effectively the whole the whole replica has to halt until that node is recovered or work fails over. Um, by um, by essentially relying, you know, by essentially relying on MVCC um, at the storage layer, it means that nodes can. Um, you know, they potentially they're reading from other replicas and stuff like that. No, you know, nodes, nodes can advance um, based on the most recent state of data in the system, but then there's all then, but then there's the, the existing history, you know, for each key that allows any stragglers to catch up. So like one disadvantage of Calvin is called a paper where like, you know, the slowest node ends up causing, um, the slowest node in the system ends up, you know, caught, and that ends up being the kind of like the bottleneck for transaction processing. You know, we can eliminate in, in, in Fauna by, being able to read from multiple by being able to fail over at a granular level to or you know fail over reads at a granular level to other replicas um and then and allow allow stragglers to catch up um the second um the second one that was interesting was um uh, taking a um assuming that um assuming that like a transaction effect application is um um requiring it to be at least once or idempotent so that um and the nice thing about that is that storage at this point you know because we're also getting reads based on our notion of like the last applied transaction um you know writes to storage itself and don't they, they they neither need to be durable nor atomic um like a transaction can you know partially write um and then the node can fail um and even persist some of that to disk um, and went, but but since we never actually published, you know, since we never actually fully successfully applied that transaction, that partial data is unavailable to read. So um, you know, the next time that node comes back up and and and, and resumes transaction processing, um, as long as it can reapply those partial effects safely, um, we end up with a correct copy of the data at the end, and then um, and um, you know have you know, not resulted in any, any, you know, corrupt reads or anything like that. But then, you know, of course, like, nice thing here is that like checkpointing, you know, can be like totally async and opportunistic based on memory pressure, you know, uh, you know, low, low quiescence in the system. And then we, there's no need for any sort of like local write ahead log or, or durability. Um, and so, um, um, like the, the storage implementation, um, you know, our 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 demands on this on the storage implement, uh, implementation itself, and you know, or it can be it's it's much less demanding in that sense. Um, the log the, oh, the 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 log layer is the is essentially the global write ahead log for the entire system. Um, all right, so that's what I had on Fawn itself. Um, at least at least kind of like the core technical details. Um, what I wanted to go into next was. Um, May take a little step back and, and just talk more in general, like some of the things that um, we found important, uh, like as, you know, some some patterns that we found you know in, in, in important for us, when, you know, building the system to be resilient. That kind of gets beyond just uh, the need for you know a, a protocol which guarantees consistency, you know, in in liveness and stuff like that. Um, so the first, I mean, the first is I think just you know a bunch of things that all. You know, it's a, a bunch of small things 
that you apply as many parts to the system and add it all together, you know, kind of make your, your, your system more resilient. So like the first one is like building, make, making sure that unit failure is as small as possible. Um, you know, like, like I said, like, you know, you know, original Calvin, like one of the flaws that, you know, you know, or one of the, one of the things that we wanted to improve on, you know, you know, immediately was this notion of like, you know, failover being at the replica level. Um, I mean, not to call it foundation, but like foundation, like, you know, if you lose a node, the entire system has to reconfigure itself um, in, order, in order to continue processing. And while that, that can be, you know, I mean, there, now, now those systems, those systems don't have any single points of failure. You know, it, it increases the operational burden a bit to have to deal with. You know, when, when failure can essentially, you know, the failure of a single node in the system, you know, can amplify to the rest of it. Um, so, like, you know, simple things like being able to restart a process or doing a sort of rolling upgrade it become a lot easier. Um, you know, if if your unit of failure is as granular as possible. Um, I mean, I, I think that, you know, that was one of, one of the, and we, we spent a lot of time operating eventually consistent systems like Cassandra or, um, you know, Twitter's, you know, like the pre, um, sorry, the pre Manhattan days that were, you know, sharded, you know, sharded my sequel. And I think, you know, that aspect of eventually consistent systems where, you know, failure is very granular, it was extremely advantageous. So we wanted to maintain as much as possible. Um, the second, I think, thing that has been pretty meaningful has been, uh, you know, also avoiding failover itself as much as possible. So, I mean, kind of the interesting thing about, well, Fauna itself, the only, the only, um, the only component of the system which has any notion of failover is in consensus where we have to have, you know, where we have a notion of leaders and there's leader election, you know, because it's based on raft. Um, and I mean, you know, so there's no getting around that, but at least I think we've minimized as much as possible. Whereas in every other, other part of the system, there's no, you know, there's no failover, there's no recovery mode, um, you know, for, for, for normal, you know, operating purpose, you know, you know, for, you know in, the, in the course of normal operations. And this, what this means, though, is that like the system running in a degraded state and the system running in optimal state, um, you know, it, you know, th those, those two profiles are as close together as possible. And so it, it again, again, this, this comes, you know, this um, eases the operational burden. Um, you know, third point, I, I think, you know, this is, um, um, I think, I think most, most folks, you know, when you've been working in distributed systems for probably about, you know, you very quickly learn that like, you know, retry because, you know, retry ends up being your enemy. And because um, if, if not controlled, it amplifies, and again, it amplifies load when you're, the system's under duress. And so, um, um, you know, we, we've um, pervasively applied a, a a strategy of using hedge requests and and, um, and 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 score keeping internally, so that we're we're um, so that nodes can you know we you know so the system can tolerate gray failures, but in those cases not um, um, sorry not not result in kind of like you know these 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 spikes in load when when failure happens, or spikes in internal load when like failure happens, um, and of course you know. You know, back pressure is important. It's 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 you know, especially in a system that's pipeline like this, it's really important for you know every every component of the stack to be able to push up and um, um, you know, every every component of the pipeline to be able to push back on what's upstream to um, you know in order to prevent from being overloaded. Um, and I think the the this the, I think the second kind of like theme I would say is this like there will be bugs, um, <laughs> despite our best efforts. Um, I mean, I think we, we spent a ton of time and a lot of work, you know, getting Fauna to like, you know, work in the context of Jepson, you know, we have, you know, you know, a, you know, a, a, kind of, a, you know a, 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 we have like a, a, like a Monte Carlo based testing harness for our consensus algorithm and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, tests and, and, you know, we're trying to fall, you know, to the best of our efforts, you know, all good engineering practices, but the reality is like, there are still bugs in the system. And, um, and so, you know, and, and we have to be resilient to those. Um, I think an interesting, <laughs> I, was, I was looking at stuff to kind of, you know, confirm my biases here. Um, but actually, no, I, 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 this, thinking about this made me recall this paper um, that, um, that showed up in the morning paper a while back, which is, uh, you know, the title is Empirical Study of the Correctness of Formally Verified Systems. Now, the, the conclusion was interesting, because obviously, like, 
the formerly verified systems had far fewer bugs than those, you know, that didn't have any formal verification. But there were still some pretty critical bugs that showed up in the shim parts of the system that were very difficult, you know, that weren't under formal verification. Um, and, 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 and I mean, you have, you know, you know, experts writing these systems, you know, you know, we're all working very hard, you know, to make these systems as good as possible. The reality is, um, you know, bugs, bugs slip by. And, you know, and oftentimes things that feel very obvious in hindsight, you know, where, you know, perhaps, you know, a, a, a mistaken a mistaken or misplaced assumption leads to a critical a critical bug. Um, so, um, the, the the other thing I would say about this too is is it's like logic bugs. I mean, we've when we've had issues in our system. It's 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 actually has not been you know, it usually is not where the, the case where like something failed in a weird and wonderful way. You know, in terms of like we lost a node, you know, or you know, we we had some hardware fail that we've never seen before. It's 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 almost always been something you know where you know we had an edge case that you know an edge case that um, got through testing, and and where you know I think our our you know our our failure handling the the failure handling aspects of the system you know didn't work, and that's because like the logic bugs tend to be correlated, right? You know, if you have a bug that affects, um, you know, if you have a bug that affects your, encode, your encoding implementation, it's going to affect every partition that, um, that, um, that touches the, um, you know, the poison key or something like that. Um, the other thing I would, I would, I would, if I were to take away any lesson to, <laughs> that I wish I'd, you know, really internalized earlier is it's like, you know, the actual liability of your system, I like this quote, the actual liability of your system depends largely on how bug free it is, how good you're monitoring and how well you've protected against the myriad issues and problems it has. So to me, that means like, um, you know, I, I, this is a great post by Jay Kreps. You know, it's 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 a little bit, um, you know, it, it's it's a few years old at this point. But like, you know, his major point is that's like, you know, this this notion of defense in depth and like investment in operations ends up being um, more in some ways more meaningful than than it, it's 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 your biggest bang for your buck. Um, so aside from testing, you know, you know, I think. I, you know, I, what I see is the response, you know, to, you know, like the strategy for making your systems more resilient, you know, it, you know, essentially falls down to good practices in terms of operations, you know, making sure they're investing, you know, in robust observability. Uh, a big one that we learned late was uh, just, um, um, that I wish I learned earlier in my career was this notion of like reducing the blast radius of, the, of, of errors in the system and, you know, reducing uh, unnecessarily unnecessary coupling as much as possible um, because you know that that way if something does happen you know you're not affecting you know your entire customer base you're only affecting a subset and so there's there's other there's things you know kind of outside the core system that you build that help increase resiliency um, here and I think that was that's an important one and again also um, the last thing I'll say is like entropy detection. That was something that you know I think was popularized by Dynamo and Cassandra, but this notion that you know there's always, you know there's always the potential for permanent failure. So it's important to you know build the functionality to to detect that, um, you know, report it, and then and ideally correct it, you know, as best you can in automate in an automated fashion. Um, Your observ observability tools is that all in house? Or are you relying on like, like open source packages, like, is that, is it a mix of things? Or is there any one sort of library you found to be most effective or most informative? Oh, yeah, um, actually, like, I mean, there's some really good services these days. I mean, I think Datadog is the obvious one. So we, we use Datadog. Um, and like, it started off as kind of like just basic metrics reporting. Um, and we'd, you know, we'd kind of bounced around from like, um, you know, you know, our own our own home world stat site um, uh, recording framework to you know a couple of services before landing on Datadog. I mean, Datadog. I mean, I mean <laughs> we can end this on a Datadog plug. But like, you know, they, they, they it's really become a, a you know it's, it's become a whole suite of observability tools. They have like you know metrics logging, distributed tracing, and stuff like that. So, um, and like. It, 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 it's either based on you know kind of open APIs or close to open APIs, so it's pretty easy to um, 
you know, it, it, I, I would say it's pretty easy to like use them or an equivalent system, you know, equivalent service or, you know, be able to mix and match. But I think, yeah, I mean, they've been a great one stop shop. I mean, it would be my first, you know, my go to choice this, you know, if we were to do this, um, you know, the next time around. Um, but the, yeah, there's, there's plenty of options there um, too. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the other the other aspect though, which I, I don't really have a good answer for how to, how how to, how to do this, but I think some of the the practices around like what you monitor, what you log, and like and, and stuff like that are things you just learn over time. Um, but I don't know of any good resources that kind of provide more of it in an opinionated framework as far as that goes. But I'm also not the most up to date, so that's fair. Anyways, that's that's all I had. So, um, okay. Yeah. So, at this point, okay. if there's any more questions? All right. So, I will clap on behalf of everyone else because it's a pandemic or over Zoom. Uh, so, I guess I'll open the floor if, if anybody has additional questions. Okay. Um, uh, so, yes. Uh, okay. So, so sorry. I I kind of have have a question because uh, something is uh, nagging nagging at me. Uh, you said you don't see uh, ben benefits from uh, reordering of tran transactions in practice, uh, which is kind of surprising to me. Do you maybe support uh, secondary indexes and especially unique indexes uh, in any way? Um, yes, we do support um, we do support unique indexes. Um, okay, and. Uh, uh, what I find strange is, uh, so suppose multiple tran transactions are uh, batched into uh, a 10 millisecond batch. And uh, if you don't support reordering, that means that uh, your pipeline would be uh, stolen. Because um, before, I, I, I mean, if uh, there is a, a ch checking of um, locks and uh, reads across nodes, that means uh, that you, if, if you don't support reordering, uh, you would have to uh, wait for reads from other nodes before applying effects of the next transactions or even starting to read the uh, uh, data for the ne next, next trans transaction. So what I can kind of find so surprising, if you don't support any re reordering, can just uh, um, perform tra transactions in their coordinated order. That would mean you would uh, lose, lose la latency bet between these steps. And uh, don't you see this problem in practice? So, um, yeah. In, in practice, no, I would say, I mean, for two reasons. So one, um, I mean, the reality is, the reality is that like, um, sorry, um, so, so I guess the first reason is, is it's like, you know, I think, you know, we only gain, you only gain the benefits of reordering when, um, like when the tra when the transactions have over overlapping key sets. So like if, if two transactions, you know, you know, obviously don't overlap, those can actually execute, you know, a a as quickly as possible. I mean, the way Fauna worked, we actually pipeline transaction execution across epics too. So the reality is that like storage nodes are are racing as 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 far you know ahead in the transaction pipeline as they can. And as long as there is an overlap, you know, parallelization, you know, it, 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 the system parallelizes. Um, that transaction application as much as possible. On the flip side, uh, the reason why I said we didn't get any effect, any benefit out of ordering wasn't wasn't due to the fact that I think ordering would help in certain cases. It's just that 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 ten millisecond window in which you can reorder transactions is 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 low is small enough that there's there's just not a lot of wiggle room there. So so the reality is reality is it's like you know even if you know even if, you know were we to implement reordering. Um, there's just not there's just not as much as you can do there and, and so in practice in practice the compute costs for doing the analysis and then doing the reordering that window um at least you know 
like it, it, it wasn't worth it. It was better. It was better just to kind of keep things, you know, keep the transactions moving as, as quickly as possible. And that's not to say that like, you know, you know, I'm certain there's like things that are like wo woefully inefficient about our implementation we need to prove. So like, uh, you know, I, it's probably, you know, it's something that I would expect us to continually revisit, but um, um, it's, it's, it's also like, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a benefit we saw in practice. It might, you know, one thing that might change that too, is it's like, you know, as we push further and further into like more atomic operations, we might see more benefits there, but at the very least in, in the OCC, you know, kind of like mechanism we have, like, that ends up being the most significant source of contention um, for for things like you know rights to single documents and stuff like that. Is it is it because uh, latency between nodes is uh, small enough, or is there is something uh, something else? Yeah, the, the latency between nodes um, within a replica, you know, for transaction processing is like is is, is low. So that's designed it, it, the way the system is is, is designed is so those reads within the reads that are required at the final step step for the transaction application, um, like the, those, the you know, those have those should be fast uh, to maintain throughput and um, and like you know I, I didn't get into it, but it, it, it's talked about in the Calvin paper, but like you know there, this you know one of the strategies for for keeping throughput up here is making sure those reads are as fast as possible. So like one strategy the paper talks about is like pre warming cache. So like sending re sending reads ahead of time to you know pull transaction data off disk and make it available for you know these 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 fast critical reads and you know by you know I think techniques like that reduce the re you know will reduce the kind of the, like the the latency that you are incurring in that step um, and also because because these reads can be fed off the 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 pipeline itself they 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 are transmitted. You know, as soon as a node knows that you know one of its peers needs a, a piece of data in order to process some transaction, it will send it. It doesn't need to wait for that node to request or anything like that. So that also eliminates um, that 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 kind of like pipe that stream aspect of this part of the system. You know, also helps minimize latency here. Okay, awesome. Uh, we're sure that we're out of time. Thank you for doing this. Uh, my one student, Abby, requests that you send videos and, and pictures of your dogs. Uh, she's very, <laughs> she's very adamant about this. Abby, where do you want him to send those things? I'll, I'll, I don't I'll, know. Okay. <laughs> but I heard them, so I was like, "Please, dogs." <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I will do that. Yeah, one of them is like a corgi, uh, a corgi lab mix, and he's he's ridiculous. So, all right, okay. that sounds good. Okay, Matt, uh, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it.